Guten Morgen, welcome in Zoominum podcast, Die Gnu Typography. I'm Eli Hoyer, and this is the first episode of my um, new podcast. Today, I wanted to talk about the concept of post authorship from the crypto space and how it can potentially relate to. Um, type design specifically with the open font license. Um, and I will be, as part of that, I'll be reading this um, essay, Unpacking Post-Authorship by Charlotte Fang. So before I get into the essay, one thing um, to understand is, um, so Charlotte Fang is one of the creators, along with the Romelia Corporation, that's responsible for the um, Milady NFT series. If you've been on crypto Twitter, I'm sure you're familiar with with these. They're very popular. It's it's one of the like more expensive um, NFT collections. And from a from a type design perspective, I think what is really interesting about that project is that it uses the viral public license, which is a copyleft license, similar to the SIL open font license. So what that means is that um, you're allowed to like copy and modify it, um, but there, there's a requirement in the license that the content has to remain um, open source, or free software, um, free culture under the, um, under the same license. So with the OFL, um, you can fork a font and modify it, uh, um, under the OFL license, but you can't fork a font and modify it, um, to be a proprietary font. Unless I think there's technically like an exception if you are the copyright holder of the OFL fonts. Um, I've seen that done before and I've, I've never been like totally sure, like if that's like working within the license or not. Um, so this is really interesting to me. Um, I'm really interested in kind of like, uh, type design has been moving a lot more towards the OFL and like certainly with like AI machine learning stuff, like the cost of doing, like font production is going down. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Um, And I think one thing that I've kind of noticed is there's the kind of like Marshall McLuhan thing of like when a new media comes along, like the new media wants initially to be like the old media. And it takes a while for the new media to kind of find its own... um, its own grain, its own like ex, um, way of like being itself and how it fits into the world. So uh, the obvious example with that with typography would be kind of early European um, um, movable type, like Gutenberg. Um, a lot of 
early um, fonts were a kind of black letter um, that were emulating the look of like what a scribe would create. And it took a while to kind of break out of that and embrace this like movable type format for like for what it is and like eventually like we end up with you know like Helvetica and modernism and um, but that you know that wouldn't have been obvious at the start of movable type like I don't think like Helvetica was the obvious (laughs) choice for Gutenberg when he was first um, first creating his first work Um, so very similarly, I think the kind of move from the the proprietary type era to the kind of open source type era, the open source free software uh, OFL era is, um, I think a lot of the ways of thinking about um, authorship and remixing and um, just you know how things are organized they're they're kind of just taken directly from the things that made sense in the proprietary type world and um there's i mean there's there's definitely like a lot of exceptions but um i think there's a lot of room to go in the direction of um of doing things in a way where they kind of take advantage of the properties of copyleft licenses. Um, So, and one thing to note is like, I don't fully agree with everything that's said in this essay. Uh, One thing I think is interesting about it is I've noticed like more than like any other area of internet culture that I interact with, the kind of graphic design and type design world has a culture of a kind of extreme ownerness ownership of intellectual property and there's a, like an ex, kind of an extreme culture of like i made this nobody can copy it like this is like my work that is like totally coming from me and my genius and i think that this is this is kind of like something that comes from the way that for-profit expensive like art schooling is structured like there's there's really no incentive for like arts educators today to promote these ideas of post authorship because the perception from the students is that if you're giving up authorship, like in the way that our economy and culture is structured now, the assumption is that you're giving up um, um, revenue opportunities, you're giving up like abilities to monetize your work. Um, And that's something that has always kind of been an assumption, even in the free software open source world. This is um, a section from the GNU Manifesto from the 80s, which um, was kind of like the founding document of like free and open source software. And they make this assumption that, of course, you can make more money with proprietary software. But we're just telling you from this kind of um, kind of like leftist perspective that the you just have to make this moral choice to make less money. Um, I'm going to read this section because I think this is really interesting to type designers. And I think the interesting thing that I see happening in crypto right now is crypto is a free software culture, but it is totally a a different culture than both free and open source software. So I see crypto as kind of like a third way that doesn't accept this claim from the GNU manifesto that you can make that you can only make less money making free software crypto is itself bitcoin is free and open source software ethereum has tons of gpl code like um 
And I mean, Bitcoin is replacing gold and real estate as a store of value. It's just incredible what crypto has been able to achieve with free and open source software. And um, so it, we can't, it's very important with moving forward in, in kind of typography and type design that we, as we kind of embrace crypto as like a way to fund and um, monetize work is that we don't, we don't fall into these old ideas that open source means you make less money. Like Miladies, there's 10,000 of them and one costs 20K. And it's a VPL project where the creators encourage people to remix and steal it. It's like, unlike the culture of like the Board Ape Yacht Club or something, like um, in Milady culture, people are encouraged to to steal the image and use it as their PFP. And, and they're encouraged to, to remix and create derivatives. And there's thousands of derivatives. And the idea is that freeing the work, like let, like letting the work become like an internet meme makes it more valuable than kind of Gollum, like, like clinging to, this intellectual property where just no one can touch it, no one can do anything with it. And that actually makes it more valuable. Um, it's weird to think like the way that an economy should work is you should be rewarded for creating value in society, for doing things that help people, that make the world better, that, um, and that just kind of just clinging to intellectual property um, technic like if you really think about it from first principles, that's not what we should reward as a society with more money. So this, this entire premise in the GNU manifesto, we, it, we urgently need to rethink this. Um, like a fair, good economy would be one where people are kind of diffusely rewarded for creating real value. And that's what I see kind of emerging in crypto. So I'm going to read this really quick. And this is something you hear this in the font industry all the time. It's like, well, if all fonts were open source, won't type designers starve? Well, I feel like a lot of them are starving now. Like, it does, it does, like what they're doing just doesn't make economic sense. And if you give up this tight control of intellectual property, there's a very good chance that you're going to be more successful and make more money. Um, so let me read this. Won't programmers starve? I could answer that nobody is forced to be a programmer. Nobody's forced to be a type designer. Like, yeah, like, get a day job. Do you, like, this is... Um, art schools kind of set people up for failure this way, where they're like, oh, this is like a full-time job, when really, it's not a very good full-time job. Like, the you have to do things the world actually like needs and wants. Um, so is it, I could answer that nobody is forced to be a programmer. Most of us cannot manage to get any money for standing on the street and making faces, but we are not as a result condemned, condemned to spend our lives standing on the street, making faces and starving. We do something else. But that is the wrong answer because it accepts the questioner's implicit assumption that without ownership of software, programmers cannot possibly be paid a cent. Supposedly, it's all or nothing. The real reason programmers will not starve is that it will still be possible for them to get paid for programming, just not as much as now. And this is what I, I really want to push back against. Um, so I'm going to get into the unpacking post-authorship essay. Okay, so unpacking post-authorship. Information wants to be free. Culture follows evolutionary flows. Viral memetics. Accreditation, provenance, patents, copyright are all burdens that strangle the free flow of the work and ruin its memetic fitness. Recognize memetic culture seeds no authorship, no credit. Art is produced in a lucid state playing handmaiden to 
collective unconsciousness, and accelerated by the web. Art comes from beyond the self, comes from the network, or God. Claiming it as hubris, plagiarism is thus praxis, freeing work from hindrance. And that's a snippet from a, another article uh, called What Romelia Believes In. And so now this starts the, the real essay. Um, it says, Romelia's post-authorship stance recognizes a contemporary death of authorship, acknowledging that remixing is the natural mode of art making online. I, I could not agree more with this specific statement. I'm going to just do a little digression here. Like, I, f I really believe this, that remixing is the natural mode of art making online. Um, we see this with, with memes and all this like creativity online. And if you zoom out on a bigger time scale, um, this kind of mimetic remixing is really what type design is. Like just, just scale out to the history of written language. And it looks a lot like meme culture where there's these little, there's these ideas and they get forked and they get these little diversions. So as the OFL ecosystem matures, I think what is going to happen in the OFL ecosystem is that we are going to move more towards this kind of natural online state of um, kind of mimetic development and less towards this um, extreme focus on authorship and originality, which is kind of th this extreme, like really extreme focus on authorship and originality is kind of a holdover from the proprietary font era. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. Introducing any friction to process materials damages the sum art output of the community. Social mores of accreditation and permissioned remixing hinder a work's ability to propagate, intact or remixed, reducing its mimetic fitness. Anonymizing work is often its liberation, and art comes from the beyond and not in isolation. As the artist serves only as a handmaiden to higher consciousness, it is hubris to be entitled to its bounties, especially at this expense of mimetic fitness. Accepting the death of authorship recognizes and rejects the social mores that hamper the ability to freely use, modify, and propagate artists' work. However, it should be clear that it is not necessarily a radical commitment to anti-authorship in all instances. It is true that artists imprint their personal interpretation of the divinity they channel, secular zeitgeist, collective unconsciousness. So accreditation, especially in the context of canonization, is very often relevant, e.g. to trace chronology of work to best understand, to best understand it in reflection with an ongoing practice. And I think this is, this is very important to understand. Um, I think that um, modernist type designers, I think, had much less concern for authorship and originality than kind of the, this contemporary postmodern identity politics type design. Um, if you look at, like, I'm a collector of these uh, Letraset catalogs. Like, I absolutely just love them. They're so kind of simple, and they, they have all these just these classic font styles just in this unpretentious um, presentation. And there's almost, there's almost no mention of authorship. Like, you know, it's like, it's almost like, I mean, I th eventually, like, sometimes in the back, they'll have like, a, like a little interview, like this person created this, but it's, it's not like the culture of, um, like, um, the kind of mainstream culture of type design today, which is is extremely focused on um, identity and authorship and originality. 
And I, what I think the, the kind of AI ML era is I really hope it kind of brings in a new wave of modernism where the, specifically in type design, where the kind of the font engineer or the design engineer, I think font engineer is a weird way to think about it because today people think of, I think people think of font engineers as not kind of aesthetic designers, but my conception of the font engineer is a lot closer to the conception of the design engineer. So to me, a font engineer is someone that has a deep understandings of aesthetics and culture and art history. Um, and they like, like the type designer kind of designs um, all the, all the code points in a font together to work well together. Like the kind of AI era, like new modernist font engineer designs like large collections of fonts to work together. Um, and they're, they're artists and designers in a way, but they're not, and they do care about authorship and they do want credit for the design they do, but they don't, that's not the, that's not the product that they're making or what they're really proud of. I think what they're really proud of is systems, um, technical qualities, um, um, groups of fonts that work together, um, so yeah, I think that there's there's a a really interesting shift that could possibly happen due to both the uh, open font license and AI and machine learning. Um, so it goes on to say this stance is one contemporaries still struggle with, and reticence to open floodgates of their work as a free player in the mimetic space as a roadblock to art's abundance. Often the trade-off in mimetic attention by requiring burdensome obligations of credit is derived from a perceived value extraction opportunity. And here they go on, this section is a quote from like an imagined like millennial artist online. Um, this section always cracks me up because I, like when I read this, I'm imagining I'm like at a type I at a bar with like a drink in my hand and I'm like listening to some like millennial type designer talk. And I, I, I mean, almost like I feel like I've heard type designers say this exact thing unironically. So it's like, so it goes, yes, my artwork did go viral, but I was uncredited. So the flows of capital did not come directly to me. Even if de demanding credit on every reshare would greatly limit how much it would spread, and the total number of eyes that see my work, it would still be a net positive of potential capital delivered to my socials, and those funds are more important than viewership. And so now the, the essay continues. It says, One must conclude... They inherently devalue their work by being unashamed to keep it chained in the dark only for the potential of extracting petty cash, probably for the better. In their inherent commercialization, they self-categorize their output as content, not art, and are thus content creators, not artists. Yet the work exists for itself and is never produced in isolation. These content creators have no real right to hide a potential to potentially mimetically potentiated work from sight just to extort fees for an audience. And it goes on to say, Romelia, like all true artists, is on a holy mission. Our arts produced in lucid communion with the network or the network's gods and it wants propagation. No value opportunity is worth keeping it locked away, but really any work of interest trapped by their creators deserves liberation. Guerrilla acts of anti-authorship in the form of non-consensual decreditation must be understood as revolutionary praxis, freeing work from a creator's artificial shackles. Steal, remix, spread all real art 
I'm sorry. Steal, remix, spread all real net art freely. All culture is permissionless. And so that's obviously one extreme end of thinking about intellectual property, where the kind of traditional font industry is on the other extreme end. And um, I think clearly that going forward into this new like AI machine learning era, like a compromise has to be found. Like the, I think it's clear that the, the extreme authorship and ownership has faults and is broken. And I also think that it's clear that they're not, everyone's ready to accept this, even though, um, I think Romelia doing what they're doing, I think they're probably making more money, believing what they're believing and putting these beliefs into practice. I think they're making more money than anyone in the font industry. Like they're making a massive amount of money because they're creating something new that people like that has value. Um, and so we, we really need to just rethink things like, um, is, is clinging to intellectual property and authorship, like really actually helping people the way that people imagine it is. So I'm going to, I'm going to conclude this for now. I'm still a little rusty with podcasting and recording. Um, but I, um, if you're interested, I'm going to, um, I'm going to make an NFT available for the artwork I created for the first issue. And I'll, um, make that available on Zora and I'll put it in the, um, the description on YouTube. So thank you for watching and, um, hopefully, um, I'll have another one soon. Thank you.